Clark and all of our musicians. Well, it's so good to see you today. A big Merry Christmas to you. And our kids call it Christmas Adam, two days before Christmas. Uh, everybody has their thing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these beautiful songs that we've sung and heard today as we once again try to capture a little bit more of the magnitude that the creator of all the universe chose to come to this earth to die for me and for us. Lord, as we take your word in a moment, I just pray that you would fall on this place in a special, tangible way with your spirit. Lord, we need your power at work. We're not here for a religious event. It's the spirit that gives life, you said, and the flesh profits nothing. And so we ask that your spirit would fall as we take your word that your spirit inspired, that you would give us new understanding. And Lord, as we pray for sister churches, we pray for Emmanuel Missionary Church in Rio Rancho and pray that you'd do a special work there today as well that you would equip them, provide for them, and use them as we join hands to try to take the gospel to a lost and dying Albuquerque. And now, Lord, give us hearing ears and help us to be those who respond to what you say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> take your copy of God's Word and turn to John this morning, John chapter 1. We'll be in the first 14 verses of John chapter 1. It was November 26, 2003, when then uh, President George W. Bush, if you remember, made a surprise visit over to Iraq, to, uh, our, to Afghanistan, to our troops there. Well, if you remember, at that time it was very unstable in that area, and so uh, it was a great risk, and no one, absolutely no one, could know. Of course, getting around the press corps is quite a challenge, and so... The night before Thanksgiving, the president climbed into the back seat of an SUV, and they quietly drove off his ranch. Now, in all of his eight years as president, like any other president, uh, he never traveled in one car. He's always in a motorcade. Traffic always stopped. But on this particular night, so that they could look very normal, the back seat of an SUV, tinted windows, and they drove off the ranch. Eventually, they were sitting in traffic on I-35 south of Waco, just crawling along with everyone else the night before Thanksgiving. And wouldn't it have been amazing if you could have been sitting in traffic next to that SUV? And that shadow of a figure with a baseball cap on in the back of the car next to you was the President of the United States. Pretty incredible story. I, I love presidential stories. But the story we're looking at today far exceeds that story because there was a young woman, very pregnant, on the road, and she came riding in on a donkey into Bethlehem. And a gazillion times more important than the President of the United States, she was carrying a baby like no other. And I want us to look at this baby in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or overcome it. Now there came a man sent from God whose name was John. And he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And there was the true light, which coming into the world at Christmas enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word, 
that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, this is a foundational and incredible text. In the beginning, John says… Now, there's a couple of things at work here. There's a couple of things that, got, that John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to accomplish. The first is him saying in the beginning. Now, the word there, arche, it's the same word that we get archaic from. It means from the core of the universe or from the very beginning. And it's difficult for us because God has not only eternity future, but He has eternity past. And so, in the beginning is just the best we can do with English words, or in this case, originally Greek words, any words, to say at the beginning, because it's hard to say before the beginning. But at the very beginning, He already existed. So, He's he's saying to us that Jesus was there from before time began. And then John is the chief of this use of the word Word, and in most of your Bibles, probably all of them, that word there is with a capital W. And the word there, logos, it's a derivation of of the word to speak. And so, even as this word, the Bible is, we call it the Word of God because it's the revelation, it's a revealing, speaking, revealing God's revelation, what He wrote for us. In that same way, then, John helps us to see that Jesus was the revealing of God in the flesh. And so, John calls Him often the Word. And so, he's speaking of Jesus. And so, he says, in the beginning was Jesus. He was there before time began. From eternity past, He's there. And this Word, Jesus, was with God, and the Word was God. You see, there are three expressions, if you will, of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're not uh, different uh, people. They're, they're expressions of one person, one God, three expressions simultaneously, not modalism where there's one and then the other and then the other, but always the same. Now, we use the words interchangeably. It's okay for you, in my opinion, to say that Jesus lives in your heart, even though technically the Holy Spirit of God lives in your heart because of what Jesus did and so on and so forth. But, but here he says that Jesus was God, and He was there in the beginning. And so, John is using language throughout this first chapter much like that in Genesis. So, he's tying this back to the beginning to say, as the Bible teaches us, that Jesus was there, and he's going to get into this creation aspect of Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was not part of God. He was 100% God in the beginning. But then in verse 3, he says, all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. We see this elsewhere. We see this in Colossians 1, that through Him all things hold together. John says for us here, nothing came into being except that He, came, he caused it to come into being. Jesus was there speaking in the creation moment. Nothing. The air that we breathe, the material that's used for these pews, for your clothes, everything came into being through Jesus, he says, and without Him, nothing came into being. It's an incredible truth. It needs to be said over and over and over that He spoke, and it happened. The Word of God spoke, and creation came into creation. In Him, verse 4, was life, and the life was the light of men. In Him was life. How do we know that God is still alive? Because we are. Life comes from God. Now, now science knows that life only comes from life. Science has created, in their own words, the necessity that life can come from nothing so that evolution can be true, but that's not what the Scripture teaches. Life comes from life. Life originates from God. We see it here. In Him was life. Now, this is physical life, but it's deeper than that. It's spiritual life, and it's life all-encompassing. 
The life was the light of men. What happens without light? It's not good. Now, we lived in Oregon for 11 years. Oregon's very, very beautiful, but takes a lot of rain to make it beautiful. And so it's dark through the winter for many, many months, a constant drizzle, and, and everyone's taking vitamin D drops, and, and there's a coffee stand every 100 feet because uh, coffee kind of helps when there's no light and, and all of those things. And it affects things. It begins to affect your bones. It begins to affect your mood. It affects all of these things. We need light. But again, even deeper than that, we need the spiritual light that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing. Again, referring back to Genesis 1, what did God do in Genesis 1? He spoke life on this earth into being, and He spoke light on this earth into being. Now, He already was life. He already was light, but He spoke life and light into being in this earth, on this earth. So He's, again, appealing back to to the creation moment, but also the spiritual aspect that we need life, eternal life, through Jesus Christ. What about you today as we celebrate Christmas? Are you in the light? Are you in the darkness? Well, there's one way to get out of the darkness and to get into the light, and that's to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what Christmas is all about. That's why we're here, to celebrate, as Clark said, that this baby is no longer a baby. He grew up, died on the cross, uh, my cross, your cross, because of my sin, because of your sin, so that if you would simply believe that you're a sinner, and that wasn't difficult for me, believe that you're a sinner, Believe, even though you don't understand all the details, that God loved you so much, He came to this earth at Christmas, died on your cross, and that if you would believe in Him and turn your life to follow Him, you could have eternal life as His payment for your sin becomes uh, a part of your life, is applied to your account, paid in full because of the cross. So have you come over into the light, and then believers, are you walking in the light, or are you walking in the darkness The things of the world fit very well with the dark. The things of the Lord fit very well with the light. In Him was life, and the light was the light of men. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or overcome it. Now, you've seen it done. The littlest, teeny-weeniest light in a pitch-dark room immediately evaporates, disseminates, casts away the darkness. Well, Jesus is not a little teeny, teeny white light. He's the light of the world, and the darkness does not comprehend or overcome him. Believer in Jesus Christ, you have overcome through Jesus. You don't serve an eeny, teeny, weeny Savior. You serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the light of the world. Be encouraged at Christmas. So if all of this is true about him and he lives inside of us, When I look around the room, I see many pains and difficulties and sorrows. What is too great for this light? Well, we know that this world that He created is incredible, uh, but I want to remind you just how amazing it is that He says that nothing came into being without Him and that heaven came to visit. Now, we know that our sun is incredible. The sun in our solar system, the closest, the largest star that we come into contact with just in our day-to-day life, 93 million miles away, eight light seconds. So that's a long way away for me. But we, as we begin to look at, at all of the multitude of the stars that God has created. It gives us a little bit bigger perspective on this fact that all things came into being and just how grandiose we get a glimpse of God being and we're still not there and it's still being discovered and, and we're still discovering new stars. But we'll just look at a couple of pictures here with us. Let's look at this, this first picture. So there's the earth. I mean, the earth's pretty big to me. Uh, I've been to many parts of it. It's a large, large planet. So there's some of the smaller plants. Let's go to this next picture and get a little bit bigger perspective of who we are. Where'd the earth go? Well, it's down there on the bottom left of the screen. Compared to Jupiter, earth is a little bitty place. When we go out a little bit further, what do we get? Uh, Where'd the earth go? You can't really see it. It's a little dot with an arrow pointed to it next to the sun. You can get a, a perspective there how big the sun is. I mean, the sun, that's incredible. You know, they don't sell solar panels very much in Oregon, by the way, either. It just, I, I didn't get those calls that I get here. 
in Albuquerque. Beside the point. Okay, let's go out a little bit then. Where'd the sun go? It's there on the bottom left of the screen with an arrow pointing at it. Arcturus, massive, massive star, 20, 30 light years, a million light years away from us. So much more massive than the sun. Let's just go out a little bit more. The, the sun is where'd it go to? These massive, massive stars. And we're still discovering them. And, and, and next week and next year, there'll, there'll be more facts and figures about how far out they are and which one's bigger. But uh, this one here that we have for us, Antares, 300 times bigger than the sun. Or, or there approximately, again, it's all a little bit fuzzy because it's hard to measure them. 300 to 500 light years away. One light year is 5.86 trillion miles. So it's nearly two quadrillion miles away. That's a long way. And we haven't reached the end. When we get to heaven, God's going to say, is that as far as you got? Because that's just my toy area there. God is, is bigger than all that. It's, it's, it's incomprehensible that God says, oh yeah, I spoke all that and all that you haven't even discovered into existence. But we pause there. We go back to our story. Verse 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this man was created. He's different than Jesus. There came into being a man sent from God whose name was John. Not the John who's writing here, but John the Baptist. Verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. So John was a messenger of the light, about the light, so that others could believe in the light, just like we are to be messengers of this light. Christmas is a wonderful time to do so. Tomorrow night at 5 p.m., we have a Christmas Eve service. You're all invited. It's going to be a wonderful time of singing traditional Christmas hymns and, and the luminarias and the candles and, and all of those wonderful things. Invite your friends. You'd be surprised they might come at Christmas Eve. But John was not the light. He came to tell about the light. The moon doesn't have light. The moon reflects the sun, and so are we to be those who reflect the Son of God, the light of the world. And then in verse 9, this is Christmas. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. That's Jesus, the true light, who created all of this and much more and chose because he was the only possible solution to our dilemma. God says, I'm holy. And before the creation of the earth, before the beginning of time, he knew he would create us. He knew he would create Adam and Eve, for starters. He knew they would sin. He knew that we would inherit their sin nature. He knew that all of us would be destined for hell, not because he didn't love us, but because of our sin. And a holy God cannot say, oh, it's no big deal. Just come on into heaven. And while you're asking questions, why did he create Adam and Eve where they could sin? Do you pay your friends? to be your friends? No, he created a world with meaning so that we have a choice, and we have a meaningful choice to choose to believe in him and to choose to worship him, or else the world would just be a, a puppet show that he created. And so he knew all of that, but before time began, he knew that he would make Christmas happen, that he would come to the earth to die in my place, to die in your place. And it says here, this light coming into the world enlightens every man. And I believe, and it's singular there, I believe that he wants everyone to hear the gospel and have a chance to say yes or no. He was in the world, it says in verse 10, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Imagine that. He created all of this, and then he came to us, but the world didn't know him, didn't receive him. I mean, surely when he was born there in that stable in Bethlehem, surely there was a citywide party. The creator of all these stars has been born. Let's flock, flock to him. No, not so much. They didn't know. The world didn't know him. His own, the nation of Israel, in the large part, rejected him. Verse 12, how can you? If I said you could meet the president, you'd be excited. I'm not trying to get political. You'd be excited. If I said you could meet the Pope, that'd be, that'd be interesting. That'd be neat. 
But I'm telling you that the Word of God says that because of Christmas, you can come to know the Creator of Antares and all the other stars we haven't even discovered yet. How? Verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name. We use this word to receive Him. We used to go to a children's museum when we were in Oregon, <clears throat> and many wonderful things, but there was this one item, and you, you've probably seen one, and it's got a, fl- a, a water flow coming through it, and there are these slots and these little plastic dividers, and the kids can channel the water, and they can, they can move these dividers to different places to block the water flow or to let it go freely and to channel it the way that they want to. I don't understand exactly how salvation through Jesus happens, but I know that the Bible says that we are sinners and that if we will believe in Him, if we'll admit that we're sinners and we'll say, I need a Savior because I'm going to die, and good people don't go to heaven, bad people go to hell, we're all bad. We need Jesus, and there's no other way, no other way. And so somehow you hear the gospel, and somehow you say, I want to believe And he takes those pieces of your spiritual heart and he opens up the channel so that you can come to know Jesus Christ. To as many as receive him, he gave the right to become. You weren't weren't born a Christian. If you're born in America, you weren't born a Christian. But when you believe in Jesus, he gives you the right to become. You weren't one. Scripture calls it being born again. Now through Jesus, you can be one to the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name. Today, if you have never believed in the name that we sung about earlier, if you've never believed in the name of Jesus, today, don't leave this place until you have done so. You don't have to understand everything. I still don't understand everything. But in a few minutes, we'll have a time of invitation, and I encourage you, if you've never come to know Christ as your Savior, don't wait another day. You don't know that you have another day. You come to the front. There'll be pastors here, and you can come and say, I want to know Jesus. I don't know him. I've believed in him in my head, but I don't know Jesus. I've never put my full trust and faith in him as my Savior, and I want to turn my life to follow Jesus. And then this beautiful ending here, verse 13 first, who were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. God causes all of this to happen, gives us this ability. We're told in the Scripture, it's not the physical descendants of Abraham to whom all the promises were made. Oh, they, have just, they have the first chance, but it's the spiritual. It's those who come to know Christ as their Savior. And then this first, verse 14, and the Word, that Jesus that John's been talking about, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is that of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And John says, those of us who've come to know him, we've come to understand that he wasn't just a poor baby born to a poor Jewish woman, although he was that physically. We've come to understand that Jesus was God in the flesh. And so now we we start out here, and again, God's much bigger than these stars that we're talking about that, that that are massive, that make the sun look like a little speck on the screen. But Christmas and John chapter 1 tells us that the Word became flesh. He dwelt among us. The word there means he pitched his tent. He tabernacled among us. God, who did all of this, chose to come and live and to live in a more poor setting than any of us. And so now we, we, we zoom back in from this on down to the next. And now the sun is a speck again and on down to the next. And now the earth is a speck again and on down to the next. And now the earth is a little bigger, and on down to the next. Oh, there's the earth we live on. On down to the next. Oh, there it looks big again to us, doesn't it? And on down to the next, to that area of the Middle East, and on down to the next, and on down to the next, and on down to the next. And now we're in Israel, on down to the next, and now we're in Bethlehem, and on down to the next. The God who created all of that by speaking it into existence and is still much more vast chose to Google Earth himself 
way on down to a forgotten hillside near some shepherds. And he's the one that created the hair on the donkey's back that carried his mother. He's the one that caused the grass to grow that became the hay upon which he was placed after he was born. What problem do you have that's too big for this God? When we were in Japan and we'd come home every few years for furlough, <clears throat> stateside assignment, we were always slightly uh, amazed. We'd travel several thousand miles home for a few months and hope they're not listening, but at the relatives who couldn't come a few hours you know, to see us where we were staying. Jesus came from far beyond the greatest stars in all of the galaxies to the earth. In your heart, have you traveled the short distance to believe in him and to receive him as your savior? I encourage you to today, and if you're a believer, can you just be encouraged at Christmas that a God so vast loves you and you and you. He loves all of us, but he did it for each one of you. How could he ever forget you? How could you ever be alone with that kind of God living in your heart? Let's pray. Father, thank you for Christmas. Oh, Father, help us to understand a little bit more today. <clears throat> oh, God, I pray for those today who really don't know you. They're religious. They believe you exist. But if it all came to the end today, they wouldn't go to heaven because they haven't come to know you. They haven't truly been born again and left the life of darkness to go to the life of light. Oh, Father, at Christmas, would you today let those just come and say, I, I, I want to believe, yes. I want that God who loves me that much who'd do this. Lord, for those of us who are believers, can we just surrender our problems and our pains to you again today, realizing how vast, immeasurable you are and that you loved us enough to do this. Lord, there are so many ways that you're speaking to hearts I have no idea. God, help us to be responders as we sing in a moment, God. Help us to step out and to take concrete action in the ways that you would have us. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.